Her mom is Jewish, her dad is a white supremacist, and her grandfather was in the KKK. What made you feel the need to connect to Judaism? There's a quote that says, like, one must become more Jewish. Where does the power for that come from? What do we actually have control over? Yes, people are always going to hate us, but we hate ourselves too. I, I mean, I'm, we don't know what to do. Angela. Sometimes I don't think we deserve Israel, to be honest. There's less and less uh, even interest in being a Jew. Let's welcome Angela van der Pluim. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Traumatizing would be <laughs> the word I would use for my childhood. And, you know, thank God I grew up to be um, a functioning adult who is proud of her Judaism because it could have gone many ways, um, not from lack of trying from my father. So my mother and my father, they actually went to the same high school. Um, my father never graduated and they met up, I want to say a year after my mom got back from college and they started dating. And it was one of those almost like Stockholm syndrome, kind of like abuse um, scenarios where it starts off really good at first and he's really charismatic and he's got this personality and he's super nice. And then all of a sudden, you know, you don't know how you got to where you got to and you're being abused. And, you know, she was just about to leave. And then she found out she was pregnant with me. So she stayed and they got married. And after about a year and a half, they divorced. She had saved up enough money and packed a bag and left. So he took off to Florida for about six years. So I didn't know who he was um, until I was about eight years old. And he came back into my life and he made me change my last name because she had changed it to hers. And that was too Jewish for him. And then he took off again and he came back two years later and he fought for custody um, and he got partial custody. So at that time I had to start seeing him every weekend. And, you know, at first, like I said, he, he was very nice. He took me places. He was a lot of fun. He pretended to be my best friend, but then all of his, let's say beliefs, he was trying to like creep into me. So, you know, he would say things like if, if you don't come home when you're older with, you know, a white Lutheran man, I, I won't only beat him. Like I'll beat you. And he would like grab his belt and whip it against the table and like threaten me because I, he didn't want me to be Jewish and he didn't want my kids to be Jewish. And I guess I should back up a little bit. My mother wasn't even allowed into the house or his family's house until she was pregnant with me because then she had their blood inside of them. Like that's how disgusting wow. these people thought. Like, How, how did the grandparents feel that their son had a baby with a Jew? Well, it turns out good. My grandfather actually changed his mindset and I was his only grandchild and his favorite person in the world. And he never um, said bad things about Jewish people to me. And he never said bad things about, you know, anyone else. And it really changed his mindset. And then before he died, he apologized to my mother. In the meantime, the KKK hood was still in the, in the attic and hadn't moved, you know, so I, did, I never, <clears throat> I never personally knew that side of my grandfather. I just knew him being a nice person. It wasn't until I was older and my mom started actually sharing the stories um, to me about all the things like that, that he used to say. Did you ever ask your dad, like, you don't want me being with anyone but a Lutheran, but why'd you have a child with a Jew? 
I was, you know, nine or 10 years old. So I would, I'm like, why does this matter to you? I don't understand. Why does it matter, you know, that I'm Jewish? And, you know, he would call me the K word and my mom and he would ramble off with different um, obscenities about her. Wow. Right. Fortunately, I guess he left again when I was about 14 because, you know, the courts decided that I could have a voice um, in the matter. And I told him, I said, I, I don't want to visit him anymore. There's no way I would want to be around him. I mean, I was an angry, angry child. Um, I actually got into drugs and alcohol at a very young age because I couldn't deal with it. Um, I got sober when I was 27. I went on birthright. I reconnected with Judaism. And here we are today. What made you feel the need to connect to Judaism or being a Jew? You know, it was always something that was missing. I did. I went. What was missing? Like a big chunk of me. Like there was always something I was searching for. And I couldn't put my finger on it. It was just like a part of my being that I was just missing. I never felt like I fit in. I never felt like I was right. I always second guessed everything. I always second guessed like the people I was hanging around with. I never felt like I fit in because there was just something about me that I didn't know that I was missing. Did you think it was partly also motivated because of that? Extreme attitude towards towards you. Absolutely. You know, and I refrained from it for a very long time. Um, I grew up in, you know, an area with not a lot of Jews. So it was always fun when, you know, the Holocaust curriculum would come up and you get the the Hail Hitlers. And I have signed yearbooks of like your number one Nazi friend. And I would deny my Judaism because I just didn't want to deal with it. You know, I got it from my father when I was younger and then you enter junior high and high school and you're one of three Jews and no one understands you and you have these different holidays and um, mannerisms. What what was your mom's connection to being a Jew or your mom's family? So it kind of went, they came over from Russia right after, you know, the like 1890 pogroms and they were Orthodox and then my grandma married a Jew and, and that's kind of where it started becoming more reformed. And now my mom's just mostly like Jewish. Jew-ish. So when my, yeah, <laughs> Jewish. So when my great grandma was alive, we did all the holidays and I'd go over there and I, you know, the whole family would get together, but then she passed away when I was about 12 and, and that's when it all stopped. So I, I had, sort of a Jewish upbringing and I, and I knew our history and I knew our holidays and I, I knew where we came from. And I went to, you know, a Jewish school at a very young age until my father came back, obviously. Um, and I didn't know that that was the part of me that I needed to reconnect with like that when I was happier as a child, like that was where I fit in and what made sense to me. And, and, and I'm curious, all throughout this this time that you were somewhat close to, to your dad, did you understand wh- where did that hate come from? Like, what wh- what is it rooted in? Or did, I, did it have a, re- a reason? Did it have a, a, a solution to it? Or is it just like... I was just told that that kind of behavior is um, taught from generation to generation. And, you know, they're, that they had always, you know held certain beliefs towards certain races. I, okay. I also hate showing this. So the reason why there are are hate crime laws in the state of Illinois is because of my father's cousin. So back in the, back in the eighties, my father's cousin um, took this woman off a school bus and um, beat her until, you know, she was stuck in the hospital because she was black. And he had to go to court and they wanted to throw him in jail and they wanted, you know, 
him to give her like a million dollars in restitution for what he did. And he hung himself and killed himself. Oh, wow. and it was a major news story and it started changing the laws in the state of Illinois. Um, and that's the family. Angela, we spent, um, I don't know, at the end, probably a year going through, you know, the process of making the podcast and, and going through all of this research and history. And if you're, you're like one of the characters, like out of so many of these historical times, um, you know, like when the, the Romans, for example, you know, came in and just impregnate all these Jewish women. And then like, there's those kids or the, the Persians came in and, and like throughout the history, I'm, I'm almost getting the chills thinking about it because it's like, we're, we're talking to a character from, from, the, from, 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 it's from the, the Jewish story. story that just, <laughs> yeah. What'd you say? Yeah. Yeah? From the Jewish story. <laughs> from the yeah. Jewish, from the Jewish historical story. And I, I literally just got the chills again that it, there's this very strange phenomenon, but we see a pattern in it that there's this like, almost like we call it in our language and someone who's new here, it might sound a little weird, but there's this kind of light that's like trying to permeate all of reality. And then, you know, like when a wave, you know, like in a Brita filter, how like it has to go through the charcoal and everything in order to come out. It's like that light kind of like comes in and then like you, you, you mix and then you rise up to this next thing and the light comes in and it like has to mix with all this stuff down here and then you rise up and we saw this story happen through we, we've traced these two movements there's the movement of the jewish people mm -hmm. and every single time that there was a huge uh, anti-semitic burst it happened along um, uh, humanity's uh, evolution so from egypt yes. to rome to Greece, to Persia, like every time a society, you know, Egypt was the biggest civilization, and then you had the Egyptian slavery. Rome was the biggest civilization, and then you had the destruction of the temple. Spain was the biggest civilization, you have the Inquisition. And it's like, and of course, America is the, the next biggest civilization, and you're like- Don't forget Germany character. in the middle. What? Don't forget Germany in the middle. Germany, there's many others along the way. Yes. But um, I'm listening to you, and I'm, thinking to myself, I'm feeling that this is like a story right out of, it's so emotional, like listening to you and actually hearing the, you know, what happened on Monday and what happened when on Tuesday when I was nine, but I, there's this other part of me that's looking at the, the, the structure of your story. And it's the story of our people, uh, through yes. all of these cycles. Uh, it's more than this. Actually, it's not a cycle. It's more of a spiral because we are hopefully figuring it out. Um, but it's so powerful. And, um, you know, you live to tell. And hopefully, yeah. you know, we can get this right um, here. There, there's another interesting piece, if I can say something else here. that And this, I have no empirical data about this, uh, whereas the first part I did. But I have this hunch that when someone is like very very homophobic like really homophobic that there's something in them that they're uncomfortable with mm -hmm. some feelings that they're trying to kind of repress and i almost wonder if like when a person maybe like your dad or someone is so anti-semitic there's something in him that wants to be close to that thing he doesn't know how to deal with it obviously he has no tools to deal with it but even though his whole upbringing and everything told him that there's something terrible about these people or something, there's still this thing inside that wants to connect to that thing. He doesn't know how, he doesn't know what to do about it, but his impulse kind of won't let him not, you know, connect with your mom and like make you, um, yeah. I don't have any well, empirical evidence around that, but it, it, it kind of seems that there's something going on there. So really the, the solution to these problems, like helping a person um, understand what's going on inside of them, where these things are coming from uh, and how to, how to fit in this process of, of life. Cause right. Like a person has these feelings inside 
you know, I wake up in the morning, I feel empty. So I just start getting pissed off at people in traffic, get, get pissed off at the person in the coffee shop. Really, I feel empty. It's not about those people on the outside, but I just don't have any patience for anyone. I'm like very short fused. Um, if I understand where my emptiness is coming from and, and I can have tools to how to manage myself where I fit in this whole process, then, um, then we can use that energy because your dad obviously had tons of energy in there, right? But the energy, yes. instead of going towards growth, kind of, you know, goes into an explosion, which is basically what we see with anti-Semitism every time. There's always push to mix these two things and, and do something good. Um, and even like you said, with your grandparents, that, that was a story that made me think of like the whole historical thing. It's almost like you, you know, that we have this expression, like a tikkun, like a correction. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you came in and like purified something there and helped that, you know, raise that, that spark that was in your grandfather. I know that I'm supposed to be here, you know, and I know that I'm supposed to be a Jew and I know that I'm supposed to speak out on it. Um, but like you said, with the, with the stories and the spirals, our history is very circular. And I have a feeling we're going to go, it's going to get worse before it gets better. So that's what we're talking because we're, right. we're, we're hoping to, you know, stay right. ahead of the, ahead of the steamroller of evolution, because we, we know what happens. Uh, and in a way, kind of like it, it, in some strange way, your personal story is a little bit like the story of the nation, uh, but what, we want to spare um, everyone uh, of the, the need to really feel that external pressure before you reconnect with that thing. Hold on, sorry. Yes. Uh, and and that's why we're um, and that's why we're what we're trying to understand is okay. So you went through this something you know very emotional very personal how do we take a lesson here um towards that the collective right like what what's what's next so what what do you what do, for you right what is it for you to to be a jew today what does it mean to connect with that that piece inside of you that part that quality that spirit that whatever you want to call it so I always like sharing my story, um, bits and pieces throughout different interviews because it, it does, it makes people sit back and it makes them, you know, think because how, uh, how does this happen? Right? Like how does a Jewish woman meet a white supremacist whose father was in the KKK? How do they get married? How do they have a kid? How does she survive? How does she become, you know, a, a proud Jew? How do these things happen? I don't know. You know, I went through these, I, it's, to me, it's God. I went through all these obstacles in my life, um, to be able to handle now. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's difficult to put your finger on and it's difficult to say, okay, well, how can we change this? How is it going to make it better? And the only way I know really how to make it better is, you know, in order to fight anti-Semitism there's a quote that says like one must become more Jewish. So what does it mean? What, what does it mean? <laughs> and, and that to me is what I've been doing. You know, I study now I study Torah weekly with a rabbi and I, I learn our history because that was the first thing I had to know our entire history backwards and forwards and, and, you know, where we traveled and, and what we went through in order to understand who we are. And then I had to understand kind of the religious aspect itself and then why people turn towards secularism and, and why people assimilate and, um, you know, understand the Jewish mindset of today, because really it's about us. What's about us? All of this. It's about us, you know? Yes. People are always going to hate us, but we hate ourselves too. Oh, there, there you go. There that's, are so many, a, we hate ourselves too. Yeah, that's the point I wanted to bring up actually from the whole story, listening to your entire story, when you described this whole thing that was happening, yeah. it seemed like none of it was in your control, right? You didn't control 
you know, who he was, who your mom was, how they met, why they got together, why you were born, how you were born, the fact you survived, all the way until your adulthood, even until, the, you know, when you got stung by that bee and you, you were able to emerge from that, right? None of it was in your, in your control, except for one thing, your inner attitude towards the whole thing, right? It's something that you could, you could somehow work with is, is something within you. Right, and I, I, I want to make this. I want to, you know, make this leap into the collective quality of, of Jews because when you go out there, when you go on on Twitter, when you go on social media, when you when you look into what how Jews are dealing with that external pressure, you see a lot of this external pushback. You know, which is important. You know, we got to do what you have to do. You have to protect yourself, obviously, right? But I don't see the Jews looking inside as. A, among us, right? And saying, okay, what can we change? What do we actually have control over? I don't have control over those crazies and all that irrational hate. And I can't sue everyone and I can't ban everyone. I can't make everyone shut up or, and change their mind and change how they feel. Not directly, at least. You can't. You just can't do it. And yet so many people are trying to do just that. I'll be the ambassador. I'll show everyone that they have to change their mind about Jews. And we're like, no, we have to first do what we can actually do. And that is start relating to one another differently. Start mending what's broken inside. Just like you were working on what's broken inside of you as an individual, we, I feel, have to start doing it collectively as a people. Yes. That, is that crazy or, or does it make sense? No, it's a desperate need right now. It's a desperate need. And you know, American Jews right now are very divided politically, um, ex extremely. And, and it goes along, you know, religious lines too, from reform to orthodox, from, you know, liberal to conservative, whatever it may be, we're divided. We're not one. Um, you'll have right wing people yell at left-wing people on how they handle Jewish issues and vice versa. And then now we have a whole group who's anti-Zionist. And as a collective, we're spreading apart instead of coming together. Have you seen any anything that works or could work to bring the Jews together? What would be some common denominator, some common... Um, you know, besides someone coming and saying, we're going to kill all the Jews and then the Jews will be like, all right, well, I guess we should, you know, band together. But besides short of that, is there, is, do we have another option? Because that is an option and that's, that's and usually that the spiral option. through history. We've seen yeah. that, that, you know, that happens. And that is the option. Um, and we never seem to learn our lesson. So that's, you know, what we're trying to rectify right now. A lot of, so in my community, um, there's a lot of outreach, especially to younger Jews. Um, but I usually go to West Rogers Park. It's uh, you know, more of an Orthodox neighborhood, but for some reason I just feel at home there, even though I'm not as religious. Um, but they do a lot of outreach and they do a lot of outreach to Jews who don't necessarily like who are Jewish, whose parents, you know, never followed the traditions, never really taught them anything. They're just, you know, Jews in name only to put it in lack of better terms. And they reach out and they take classes and they and they learn again about their history and who they are as a people. And then they start talking and then you start finding all these things in common. And then it doesn't start like it doesn't matter that someone is liberal or someone is conservative or someone thinks that way, because we all have this common identity where we feel like we fit in and we understand each other. And it, it's been well, it's been growing from there. And it's difficult at times to navigate around the uh, Jewish opinion, but it's seeming to work. Well, you know, that's a, that's a problem. We, you know, we're Jews. We're plagued by opinions. You know, yes. It's like, it's, it's, everybody's got them, several of them. And it's, we have to try to find a way to somehow feel one another above the opinions. Opinions are great. You know, it's what makes you unique. You have that opinion. That's amazing. But how do we do? And the, the the what's driving me crazy is that I see all those, um, you know, attempts to basically like it, you try everything, you know, the same thing you tried that didn't work, you try it again and again and again. We have in one of the episodes, I think we played a clip from The Simpsons where Homer is trying to get like you know illegal cable and he's like climbing up the 
the the the, the electric pole outside his house <laughs> just starts to fuss with the cables He's like let's try the red cable and he just, you know he gets a shock and then okay let's try the blue cable it gets a shock okay let's try the red cable again <laughs> and we're like we're like that we're just we're like it's is that we're not changing and i just got um you know there's obviously the school that says okay let's just be less jewish right that would make everybody like us more and now i see in new york students and staff at New York College pledge re-education programs for Jews to unlearn Zionism, you know? Yep. So yeah, let's just, un- let's just move away from, and I, I mean, I'm, we don't know what to do, Angela. We, we don't know what to do, how to get people to see that it's not about those things. There's, and this is where, where our thing comes in, like where it connects with, with your story, where, like on a bigger level, you know, this Jew from the word Yehud, you know, united, that's really what the essence of, of this group of people is. And as crazy as it sounds, you know, what if it's not that crazy? You know, what if that is the case? What what if the the role of Jews is to bring unity to the world? That's it. Everybody has different roles, right? The cells in the body have different roles. That's our role. That's okay. You know, we're not all the same. Everyone has something, you know, to do here. Uh, why why not try it? I said, let's for one year, let's try to to be together, to be like brothers and sisters. We have to unite ourselves first. We're never going to unite the world. Uh, no, That's no, us, yes. I, yeah, us. Us. <laughs> us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe you, you start in your own community and then you move forward. You know, they say you've got to start with yourself and then you can move on to the next person. And it's like a domino effect. And, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. This- and that's something we need to do because we don't do that. I myself sometimes find myself arguing with another Jew and I'm like, what are you, what are you thinking? And then I have to take a step back and I'm like, okay, listen, we shouldn't be fighting with each other. They're trying to make us less Jewish, like you said, especially like, you know, the whole thing that's going on in Cooney, New York and, and everything. And they're 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 trying to make us less Jewish. So we need to be, like I said, more Jewish. We have to be prouder of our heritage. And I think a lot of American Jews just aren't anymore. I think we I think they don't know. I think they I, just don't they don't I, know what it is, what it the, really is. I think yeah. that this yeah, weird. So you say, Seth knows you. You, you grew like, up be, as an American Jew. Yeah, when, right? you, when you say be more more Jewish, um, it's funny because to Leo and I, we we brainwashed ourselves already to what this word means. Uh, that it's 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 not informed as much anymore by we received in the seventies growing up from politics and Hebrew school or 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 the news but that there's a group of people starting with abraham back in babylon where the where the jews came from ones in light ones in fat ones in thin ones and and all different kinds who that what it means what what this actually means to be a jew as something different from some kind of um education about uh the garden of eden but that there's the, that the essence of who we are is this united that is a group of people who are united uh, uh, despite all of their differences. That's what brings them together. Thanks to all the differences, meaning they're able to actually exercise unity above the differences, above that, that resistance to connect. We can, we apply this opposite pressure and we talk about, about it a lot. That's what creates this, you know, if we're the same and liking each other, there was no, it's like, there's no, Right. There's no 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 work is done. No, no light is generated in the circuit. But when you put plus and minus together, you said, you, you know, you're going to not short circuit. We're going to put a little light bulb or a resistor in the middle. And now you're going to have you can produce heat or light or whatever. That's exactly what that's a, that's the essence of of what Jews should be doing. Uh, we already like to argue. We just need to add the, you know, the second half on top of it and and and. And then that would be an example to everyone. And it sounds so simple in, in theory. I don't know why it's so hard to accept. Why do you think it's so hard to accept? Rather, let me ask you a different question. How did you manage to do it within you? You know, as an individual, seeing all this c- crazy dissonance that you grew up with, uh, and, and I'm sure all these voices inside of you for and against, and, and I'm sure all that internal struggle, but somehow you are able to go through all of that, crawl out the other side and and then create an internal unity in you. And those things, they don't disappear. I mean, they're still there. All those contradictions, all that, it's still there. And yet you have this on top of it, right? So how do, how, how do you, maybe your experience will shed light on 
I mean, you know, it's a, it's a battle every single day. And even if you, maybe for one moment you wake up and you forget that you're Jew, the world likes to remind you, you know, like you're like, you wake up and then all of a sudden you get a message and you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm living this world in it, you know, as a Jew, but it's not just my experience. I think So the world right now is very into identity politics and it's very into um, saying I'm this, I'm that, you know, I'm this religion, I'm this race, I'm this, and everyone's like really proud of it. and, and, And they focus on just one central thing and they can't, for some reason, I feel like they can't. And as Jews, we can't see beyond that either. And we can't see that like, okay, who cares if you're this race? Who cares if you're this religion? Who cares if you, you know, have this mental illness or you like dogs or cats or or whatever, like we all have these differences. Right. And like you were saying, we have to come together and we have to find the common ground and we have to unify. And for me, I had to close out the outside world and everything that was going on because it's all nonsense. Everything out there to me is nonsense. You know, what my dad used to say, the flashes in my head that I get sometimes of, you know, like what happened when I was little and what he used to say. And, and, um, just thinking about my grandfather and my family and, and things with my mom. And then, you know, my childhood and then the internet age and, and all this stuff. I, I just have to push to the side and focus on what makes me happy and what makes sense to me. Where's the power for that come from inside inside, you know, and it's scary. Um, it's scary and it's hard. And because sometimes some days you get hit with it all day long, especially in the internet age. You know, comments, messages, direct messages, memes. Then they start emailing you. Sometimes they call your mother. Um, I've had harassment up and down. And to tune it out is not easy. But to turn it off is I put away my phone. Then I can't see it. And then I go out and I go hang out with my friends or, you know, I go down to the local neighborhood and I go get coffee and, and, and meet face to face. And I, I put it away. Because that's, then what it's we, there. that's what we believe. We, we believe you need friends for that, actually, because you yeah. really can't do it on your own. Uh, no, and so. you can't. Um, again, in this age, we don't do that. Take a take a phone away from a teenager and, and see how fun that is. Um, but you have to you have to find it's like this voice in your head you know, you've got the big voice that's telling you the doubts and there's that little tiny voice in the back of your head where you know what's right. And you have to bring that one forward. And that's the one I have to keep listening to. And I don't do it all the time, but like you have to keep, it's like a constant thing to like train your brain to, to continue to do that. And, and that's what I've been doing. I can't listen to all of those doubtful voices in my head. And I have to continue to do what I like and what I know is right and what I know is good. And, you know, this is a great reminder for me because you have to do it within your own community. I mean, I don't know how many, I don't know how many, you know, Jewish chats you're in, but it gets kind of hostile sometimes. And, and you always have to take a step back and you have to remember, okay, this is my community member, like this is someone that's, you know, supposed to mean something to me. Like, it's not just a person on the internet that you don't know and can't see. Um, And a lot of it too is how many face-to-face interactions does the world have anymore? Jews do, we have Shabbat, right? It's true, not not only Shabbat, by the way. I mean, there's a lot- But I'm just saying, like, it's it's one weekly thing. But no, no, but but you're right. I mean, there's a lot. Uh, we talked about it a lot. I mean, there's a lot of small things that Jews naturally find themselves doing. Usually, as a teenager, you kind of resent it, like, oh, I gotta go to grandma again. But the reality is that you do have a lot of this warm, sticky environment around you, and Shabbat, and this holiday, and that holiday, and this bar mitzvah, and, that, and it's always, and and there's there's power in that. And we don't we we think it's like you know schmaltz, and it's nostalgia and it's like old-fashioned but it's no it's it's the real power it's the only power that jews have the, the, 
the yeah. only power. It's the it's the one thing that we need to learn to appreciate. I think, you know, um, I don't see other communities doing it as often. I see like you were talking about in the beginning, we're coming to a new age. Um, I think we're in a new era. You know, we had an industrial era, a golden age and, and, and this, that and the other. I think we're on the precipice of of a new era. And I don't really know what that looks like. Um, I just know it can't look like right now. No, it cannot. And I, I don't, I also honestly don't know how much time we've got to continue to just, you know, n you know, not commit to, to it's do, not a to, lot, not it's a lot not of time. I, I, that's what I, I mean. Yeah. I mean, we don't like to, to kind of say it, but, but the signs are not great and it, it's very, very quick. Uh, things can, can turn from, <clears throat> You know um this free country fun loving to this totally fascist um relationship between people <clears throat> and it doesn't have to look like what it looked you know 70 80 years ago it can take a different uh clothing and still just be terrible and i don't know i you know i we ask some sometimes we ask people if you know do you think do you think all the jews should move to israel i don't i'm not sure but i think what do you think by the way Sometimes I don't think we deserve Israel, to be honest. Wow. It's the best answer I've heard. It's honest. It's, uh, it's, it's true. Granted, I'm a huge advocate for Israel, and I love Israel, and I'll stand behind it, you know, with my life. But sometimes I feel us as Jews and us as a community, I don't feel like we're doing enough to deserve it. And I think um, we'll lose it again. Wow. I, think that, I mean, think about it. All, all surrounding countries are against it. Um, American Jews are becoming against it. It's, you know, not just a fad anymore. It's, it's growing. Yeah, yeah it's growing and maybe that is one of the facets of um let's say let's call it prongs like maybe we need a three prong plan and one of the prongs needs to be we need to go back to our own communities maybe we're not the same doing that way enough. that the same you know i had my non-empirical research at the beginning but the same way that i said that you know maybe that the the homophobe there's some feeling in him that he's repressing and mm -hmm. maybe with your dad that there was something that you know even though he was raised a certain way he needed to touch that spark i'm seeing now in in what we're saying that the world also is homophobic or like you know and the world has this need to connect with this spark yep. but because it doesn't know how to do it it's just this big clash and from what's going on here, the way that the world can connect with this spark in a, the most healthy way is if this spark becomes a, a burning flame of love. If becomes if 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 all sparks, you're you're going through this, and Leo's going through, and I'm going through. If all those little sparks come together, uh, we don't need to kind of mandate from above how everyone should behave, but if we can all come together, there's this big organic flame with all these opinions and all this power, and and it's 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 enough to, uh, it should be enough uh, for the world to be able to to be lit up from it in a good way. Exactly. I mean, imagine trying to mandate all the Jew like world Jewry. And tell them how to behave. It'll never work. It'll no. <laughs> not even for a second. No, not, no. But no. again, you just said it. We all go through our inner struggles, and we can all come together on that because it's, what's the commonality there? We're all Jews. That that was that was the thing that we were thinking. Like, okay, what you know? How can we um, add this one? tiny effort in the right direction to what every, whatever everyone else you know is doing because everybody's got their own thing everybody's got problem when you when you break it down to, to your day to day i gotta get up and go to work and deal with this and deal with that and then i have my little passion project or i volunteer or i do something and 
everybody thinks they're doing right. I'm sure nobody thinks, oh, we're doing the wrong thing, but we're just going to keep doing more of it. I'm sure everybody, even all those who are making all those terrible mistakes, are convinced they're doing the right thing. So we're saying, how how can we just add this concept of unity to everything else you're doing? It's like, you know, when you start like a, on a when you get on a, on a you know, want to change your eating habits, they say, don't, don't do some anything drastic. Just add something good to your, you know, add some juices or, what, or teas or herbs. Add something good to your diet, and it will, your body will gradually push out all the other stuff. So how can we just add this ingredient, this spice of unity, to, to everything we're doing? So it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter where your heart is, where your passion is. How can we just add that? What, what, what do you think? What can we do? And I mean, I know you're working on a book, so that's great. I'm already good luck on that. But yeah. I mean, I think you guys are starting just by talking to different Jews and, and getting their voices out there, you know, I think that's a good first step. Um, like I said, there are many different people who are out there who are reaching out to younger Jews, which is a very big thing right now. I think um, if we don't do that, we'll lose them. We'll be done. Um, yeah. The Orthodox can only have so many babies. I'm sorry, guys. Do you, do you have connection <laughs> to the younger generation, teens or twenties? Or um, I do. I work with uh, different organizations from time to time. So they do a lot of like on campus stuff. Um, I do a lot of local stuff um, here in Chicago with different rabbis, different organizations, and they reach out and they actually come up with different um, events that all of these young Jews can go to. And it, it's just, it's weird because there's like that middle age where people didn't have events, right? So like late teens to like early thirties, there's like this huge gap of like Jewish life. If once you end like college, there's this huge gap and you kind of lose it all. And they were kind of filling in that gap. Right. And I liked that because it brought me in and it helped me understand Judaism. And I was doing it with people my age who understood what I was going through, who didn't necessarily, you know, some of them had a closer relationship um, with Judaism than I did. And some of them had less, but we were all on the journey together. That's something that like, I think is needed. When you say it like that, it feels like there's a huge opportunity because everyone uh, doesn't isn't receiving, you know, if you're seeing like a very strict religious upbringing or something like that, it's, it doesn't allow you a lot of freedom of thought. Or if you're very, very secular, you don't have any of the normal rites of passage that Homo sapiens have had or for you know, thousands of years. You know, you, you enter the, the men hunting or you learn how to, or you give birth or like there's all these rites of passage that our society has none of. You're talking about this this um you know between teens and 30s it's like a open so much possibility there because people have power and it's like a clean slate mm -hmm. they don't have too much from the religious and they didn't receive anything proper from society these kind of, of passage and, uh, initiation into being an adult or anything like that uh, and everyone feels very individualistic it's almost as if the table's been set for the perfect meal. If we can just bring everyone together and uh, and circle everyone with this unity, um, the kind of correct Jewish education of of unity, we may have an opportunity here. I, I think so. I think um, it's also going to take a lot of compromise. You know, from the secular side, they're going to have to. Um, except the more religious side and the religious side, they're going to have to realize like, listen, not everyone grew up the same way you did. And in the beginning, a lot of our rabbis had to go to non secular Jews and, and, and teach them, you know, Rabbi Akiva went around and, and how many followers did he get from his R R Rabbi Akiva wasn't Jewish. Wasn't he? Was not. Yeah. Well, he no, converted. he was. He converted. Converted. Yeah. That's my, my point. Oh, okay. No, I was like, like, like most of the most of the Jews, most of the great, not most many oh. great, great Jewish, you know, personalities were not Jewish because, and it just reinforces our idea. Yeah. 
it, it's an ideal. You buy yeah. into an ideal. It's not something Listen, you, you know. Most of our converts today are more gung ho on Judaism than, you know, people who were born Jewish. It's just. Sure, they, sure. We also, by the way. <laughs> No, totally. And we, by the way, we, we also believe, uh, I mean, not, maybe believe is the wrong word, but we, we see that um, more and more the, um, the, the external garments of Judaism uh, were used to, again, keep the Jews during this time of exile. Because again, we were once in this ideal of unity, and we talk about, yeah. we have an, an episode that talks just about that time, and then fell from it specifically in order to mingle among everyone, just kind of like how you need those you know, certain hormones in the body to spread around the body and then to wake up and move the whole body into puberty, right? And we kind of, this is kind of where we are. And now, uh, just just when we were waiting, we needed the, those external garments and all these very strict frameworks to keep us t together, really. Uh, even when you forgot about the internal ideal, you still were kept together. And then when you try to leave even that framework, you got hit. <laughs> so, yeah. but now... I think we're going to see more and more shedding of those external things and more focus, I think, on what's really important, which is what's happening between us. I mean, you can you can put all the tefillin you want and pray six times a day, but if you're not going to connect with your friend, then it's worthless, right? It's that's it has to it has to we have we need a change of heart. Yes, from the entire spectrum because Correct. we're all stuck where we are and we're all had we're Jews we're headstrong we're, we're headstrong and then you know we don't like to change that right uh, yeah we're, we're yeah. I, yeah I admire uh the power that you found um inspired you. uh that you're able to do that and uh tell that story tell this story and I hope that we can stay connected somehow and that you're able to stay connected with all these people because we all go through yeah you know, these down periods and it's very helpful to be able to keep encouraging each other when when we're when we find ourselves down to have friends who keep us going um and that we can help each other and that so hope we're able to uh, keep this connection and that we can be successful bringing some more unity and hopefully <laughs> see good results in the whole world from it yeah, we, we, we will be successful. I have a good feeling if uh, Angela could do it on her own, for sure, as a group. If we just, you know, turn a little bit towards each other. So uh, this is it. If you want to know uh, more about uh, about all, all of this, all you have to do is just listen more to the Jew Function podcast and like us, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, yeah, wh wherever Jews are, basically. And uh, we... It was really amazing to um, to meet you, Angela, and I, I do hope that we we, you know, we meet. As Seth said that you know we meet again and we see how things change and move. And of course, if you're in Israel, by all means, um, you know. <laughs> That's my favorite place. Well, you're invited. Seth is coming here in a month, so uh, no, not in a month, in a couple of weeks. So that should be fun. And uh, to all uh, of our listeners, we, you know, thank you for listening and for being here. And we'll see you all uh, next week on the Jew Function. We have to do it again. Thanks so much. Thank you.